had a conference here this past weekend, and I don't know if you can feel it, but I'm still living in the overflow of <laughs> God's goodness. Amen. I just want to invite you guys to stand, if you aren't already, and just posture your hearts to the Lord. We love you, Lord. I just, I surrender every part of my mind to you right now. I give you all of my attention, all of my focus. Lord, I always want to be in awe of you, but I don't want to be surprised when you do something awesome. Let us just be in awe of your presence. Can you just tell him thank you for this past week? Whether that's the breath in your lungs, whether that's the friends that you have around you or the family that you have around you. I'm so thankful, Lord. You're so good. You're so good. And life is better with you. Who can agree life is better with the Lord, amen? There's no other life like this one. The one where I can live with you hand in hand. Jesus, we love you. Just tell him you love him. Jesus, we love you. When I'm lost in Cause it's 
much better Life with you is much better Hand in hand with you is much better Heart abandoned and loving And your plan is better Keeps on getting better yes. Keeps on getting better Keeps on getting better The more we walk with you as a commitment we submit to your plan because it's better it's higher it's exceedingly abundantly more than what we think we need what we think we want because it's better
sacrifice them up to you. We leave them in your hands. We submit to your plan.
ministers we sing.
are yours father we belong to you for from you are all things and to you are all things you created us in your image we bear your likeness God so that we can worship you and so that we can strive to be like you you sent your son Jesus God to be our model to show us to teach us how to live and how to be like you father so this morning we repent God we repent for chasing after every worldly thing everything that doesn't bear your image God forgive us Lord for chasing after worthless things this morning we chase after you we chase after your holiness and your righteousness God we want to be more like you God we just turn to you today you know this morning whatever that thing is maybe there's something that you're holding on to something that you're chasing something that you've been pursuing that God's tugging on your heart right now and saying you need to let that go. You need to let it go. You need to lay it down at the feet of Christ. Don't waste any time. Don't wait till the altar call. Don't wait till tonight. Don't wait till tomorrow. Lay it down right now. Say, Jesus, I belong to you and you alone. And all these worthless things, even things that have 
that have gotten attached to me. God, I lay them down. I don't want to carry them anymore. One of my favorite interactions with Jesus is with his disciples when he washes their feet. One of the great revelations that I get from this story is that he's saying that your body is clean, but your feet are not. And spiritually, that is so true. We've been washed clean. We've been made brand new. Jesus has washed us clean. But as, but as we walk through life, our spiritual feet get dirty, right? We pick up things just doing life. We're not, we're not trying to. We're not purposely going out of our way to step into areas, you know, of, you know, compromise and sin. But just through life, we pick up things, you know, we pick up offenses, And we pick up all these things that Jesus is saying, you need to bring your dirty feet to me so that I can wash them. And so maybe there's things this morning that God's revealing, that God's exposing. We need to bring our feet to him. And sometimes we have to humble ourselves to do that because let's be honest, some of us have dirty feet. We have nasty, stinky feet. And let me tell you something, I'm not letting anyone see my feet and touch my feet. That's not easy to do. But this morning, some of us need to be like, you know what? Jesus, here's my feet. Here's my feet. Can you wash them? And he will. He's not afraid of your stinky, nasty feet. He's not afraid. In fact, he welcomes them. He says, bring me your feet. Because you've been, you've been washed, but your feet are dirty. So this morning, Jesus, we just, we thank you. We thank you, God. We are just so amazed by you. God, and we pray this morning that as we bring you our feet, God, as we bring you all the things, God, that have gotten attached to us and the things that have, uh, the things that we've picked up just along the way, God, and the, just the busyness of life and the busyness of the week, the anger and the, and the tantrums and the attitudes, and the offenses. God, we just lay those things aside. We're sick of the enemy trying to sow discord in this house. We're sick of the enemy trying to bring in bad attitudes and drama and all kinds of nasty things. God, we just, we release them. God, we send them back to where they came from. We don't want them. God, so we just pray that you would cleanse us, God, that you would wash our feet once again, God. That you would cleanse your people, make us whole, and make us new, Jesus. Have your way in this place, God. We want our hearts to be ready to receive all that you have, God. We don't want anything in the way. God, so break down every wall and every hurdle and every distraction. God, you have our full attention this morning. Speak to our hearts and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just give him a shout of praise. Father, we thank you. Amen, amen. Why don't we just take a moment and say hello to our neighbor. Say hello to each other today. Show some love.
Good What's morning, up, Faith Chapel. Oh. Tim, Tim, check, check. What's up, Joel? Tim, Tim. How are you, sir? Good. How are you doing? I'm great, I'm Looking man. good this morning. A little tired as we were just what? talking, but oh. but we're awake. Strength to our bodies now. in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. You were just saying, Joel, that there's no substitute for sleep. There's no substitute. And, and how true that is. Yeah. How true that is. We need yeah. to find rest in the Lord, yeah. man. Yeah. Amen. 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 Not just more coffee. We need sleep. We need, <laughs> we sleep. need rest in the Lord. We need, we need rest yes. in the Lord. Amen. I don't know where we're going with that, but man, I know I need that. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. I just hope that you're blessed and you enjoy our service this morning. We're just getting started, man. We're just getting started. And in fact, if you're new here, we want to invite you to text FC New to 77411. And uh, we would love to use that uh, to, you know, get connected with you. And also, we would love to meet you after service. There's a pop-up shade uh, right outside the front. And so come and meet us. We'd love to put a face to the name. Amen. And put a gift in your hand and um, get to know you. Uh, we also want to um, uh, remind you that we are on social media. So if you're on social media, make sure to follow us. It's a great way to, you know, stay connected with us and, and find out what's happening and what's going on throughout the week. And so we also have another baptism coming up. Amen. I'm super pumped about that. We're doing that monthly. And so it's, can I just say, it's amazing to see God changing lives. It's amazing to see every month people coming to the stage, getting baptized, fully surrendering themselves to Jesus. And so our next baptism is going to be April 28th. So it's happening just a couple weeks. There's still, still time to sign up. You can go to, go to, our, go to our website, faithchapelsd.com, or you can scan the QR code and let us know that you want to get baptized. We want to celebrate that and invite you to do that. It's going to be amazing. So April 28th. Amen. Also reminding you that every Wednesday we are here for a midweek encounter. It's a wonderful time. God's doing just a great work. And so we invite you to come on out for that, for worship and the word of God. And for people like Joel and I, for our kids, um, it's just amazing, right, Joel, to be able to bring our kids and know that they're being sown into, that they're being ministered to. So know that that's available as well every Wednesday night at 6 30 amen so another thing that's coming up around here is a regional prayer night it's happening on april 21st here at faith chapel so we're linking hearts with another ministry and so they're, they're coming to join us for that praying for america praying for our nation and we just want to believe god for our country and that god would have his way that god would open up the hearts of men and women amen and that america would churn their hearts back to Jesus. And so some San Diegan political leaders are going to be in the house as well. So we just want to join with them in prayer for our country, for our nation. So that's going to be April 21st. What else we got going on, Joel? We've got a VBS going on. My kids have been asking about it, and now I can finally tell them. So we've got VBS coming up, which is very exciting for all the kids in the house. Um, and there's going to be a meeting after service in the hospitality suite, but there is also going to be a table in the lobby for more information if you would like to assist, if you want to uh, lend a hand and help in the effort of getting the gospel into our kids, uh, please do so. Uh, we also have foundations class. Uh, I've been richly blessed by... Mr. George, who's been uh, leading the foundations class, and I want to say something about this real fast. So I remember <clears throat> on Easter, we had all the, uh, the decisions that happened for Christ. And so then the foundations class that followed that, I was like, okay, cool, we should have a lot, a lot more people in it, but I didn't see those same people. So I only wanted to say that to say this, that the decisions that happen in here should be a translation to bodies in there because that is discipleship. It is having, ha making the decision for Christ is only the beginning, but getting a true, firm foundation of discipleship uh, class is, is, is so critical. I can't stress it enough because, you know, it makes me think the, the house built on sand, the house built on, on rock, right? And same thing goes here, that both houses were built, but it's like we want to have a firm foundation for our faith so that we can launch off and we know the enemy is going to try to knock us off course. So this is to help with that, to help stand strong, to help stand firm. Also, there's community in that as well. So please, 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 if you're new or haven't been to a, a discipleship class, come check it out. It is very good. Um, also, men, we are going to the Padres game. Can I hear a couple men in the house? Okay, all right. You like a good Padre game, Tim? Yes. 
sir. Yeah. Do you like peanuts and cracker jacks? I do. Actually, I like hot dogs, but yeah. Okay. Do you root, root, root for the home team? Yeah. <laughs> I see where you're going with this okay, now. Okay. I do. I do. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. <laughs> All right. So if you're a man, you're in the house. <clears throat> Our men's gathering this month is going to be at a Padre game, and it's encouraged if you have kids, bring your kids as well, forming those bonds between fathers and their children. Awesome. Um, and women's, okay, this is actually funny too. So my wife last night, uh, she was like, she's like, when are they going to have a women's, uh, women's gathering? And I was like, it's funny you ask. I'm actually typing that in right now. <laughs> Finally, we have a women's event that's coming. Something for the men and something for the women. Um, it's coming. It's going to be February of 2027. Mark your calendars. It's going to be awesome. Please get excited. Start now. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's actually going to be uh, May 11th. So get excited. Just around the corner. It sounds like May's a long way off, but no, no, no. That's tomorrow. May 11th. Um, FC Summer Camp, also something else exciting for the kids. Summer Camp we have here, it's going to be May 28th to August 7th for kids, uh, kindergarten through 7th, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 6th grade, kindergarten through 6th grade. Uh, if you have a kid, they want to get down, be around other, other Christian kids. It's also kind of like a good opportunity for, for uh, daycare if you're working right and you want to have have the word sewn into your children as well please check that out uh all and most everything that we're saying is is in the app or on the website so if you can find the registration there um if the ushers don't mind coming forward we're gonna receive this morning's tithes and offerings oh father god i just thank you for all the deposits that have happened in this house over the years from the very beginning all the way up and th up until now all the rich rich deposits of the word going forward the worship god the honoring you the exalting you thank you for what happened uh the last two days in this house god and we pull on that we want to keep the momentum lord we thank you so much for your holy spirit here this morning holy spirit would you just be that deliverer this morning would you be that minister this morning would you be that chain breaker this morning would you make us whole this morning in a way that no one else can speak to us reveal your word to us as pastor josiah delivers the word i pray that you would your holy spirit would be the the revelator and just showing us what that means i ask that you would bless this offering bless this tithe multiply it on both sides thank you for the giver thank you for the heart god we honor you we love you we worship you in jesus name we pray amen amen can we just praise god one more time together Let's sing this out one more time. It keeps on getting better. Keep on getting better. It keeps on getting better. As we serve you, Jesus, keeps on getting better. Every move we make towards your presence, God, is like
There are 1.2 billion Indians in India. Every day, they're searching for the truth. Every day, they're waiting for a touch from God. Many wouldn't even walk into the church because they don't know what church is. So we go to them. To the sick, we invite them into our hospitals for free treatment. And as we're treating them, they begin to ask questions such as, why would you do this for me? Why do you care? And we answer this 40,000 times a year while providing free care to 40,000 patients. And as they're hungry, we invite them to our feeding stations. And they're curious, why would we provide them with free meals? and send their child to school, but can't afford it, we come alongside of them 32,000 times a year for 32,000 children. It is not about compassionate care, though that is what we do. It's about creating opportunity for the lost to find the truth. About creating opportunity for the lost to find Jesus. And that is what you're doing when you partner with us. Namaste. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be here. My name is Brent Galbraith, and I represent Calcutta Mercy, and, and uh, Pastor Josiah has been kind enough to allow me just to take a couple of minutes and really thank you, because this church has been a, has been a friend of Calcutta Mercy for quite some time, and I'm not sure that you even realize all that you're doing in India, but you watch that. As a matter of fact, um, India is a, is, a, is a place that is changing rapidly, and I want to tell you a little bit about that in just a second, but first of all, i got to tell you, here's a confession time. I am so excited to be in San Diego today. I have, uh, I'm born and raised in Georgia. I pastored for 33 years in New Jersey. I'm living in Florida, been to 22 countries, never been west of Oklahoma except one time, and that was in in and out Phoenix, and I've always wanted to come to San Diego. So I had the opportunity for the conference and different things like that, and so it's exciting to be here. I texted my wife this morning and said, yep, the landscape's as beautiful as they say. So, uh, so uh, it is beautiful here, but it is it's truly, truly such a blessing to be here today and just to share a couple of things about, uh, you know, I said I was a pastor for 33 years, and one day um, I, we, we've always had a church that had a heart for missions, and um, I was trying to, to, uh, trying to send some money from our church to um, Calcutta Mercy, and I reached out to the president, and I said, hey, they were, hey, we're having some trouble getting some funds in, and I was just kidding with him. He's a friend of mine, and uh, I said, listen, if you don't, if, if, if we don't get this fixed, I'm sending this to, if we have a mutual friend who was, who was a, um, a missionary in Africa, I said, I'm sending it to Africa. And so he sends me back three words in a text, don't you dare. <laughs> and he called me. And then he said to me, he says, why don't you, he said, he said, India has rocked your world and you know it. I said, I know it, yes. 
And he said, why don't you consider coming and working for us? And I have to tell you, at that moment, God began to work in my heart and in my spirit, and I'm so grateful that, that he did. And now um, I represent uh, Calcutta Mercy. It's a ministry that's been in India f- since the 1970s. We've been there for quite some time, and we have a great relationship there in India and many workers and many things that are happening. But what I would like to do is just take in the few minutes here. I want, you, I want to tell you a few things about India to help you understand why, and I want you to hear this, why we have to win India now. Why the time is right now to win India for Christ. And I want to share that. I want to give you a few things, and then I want to tell you what Calcutta Mercy is doing about that. And I'm hoping you will enjoy that part because, as I said, you've been a friend and have, have invested into Calcutta Mercy, so you're a part of what God is doing there as well. You know, April of last year, India became the most populated country in the world. You heard there on the video those 1.2 billion. We knew that it was more than that, but the new statistics had not come out at that point time, now they have come out 1.5 billion people in India. It is growing so quickly, so rapidly, and let me help you understand this or help me put this in perspective. India is growing a net gain of a state of California every 25 months. Think about that. That's how many people are born minus how many people die. That net gain, it is growing a state of California every 25 months. According to the Global Hunger Index, they say that 35 to 38 percent of of the Indian children, which is, by the way, 500, uh, it's, it's 500 million children. That's a United States and a half. 500 million children are school age. And the Global Hunger Index says that 35 to 38 percent of those children have stunted growth mentally, uh, physically, and psychologically because of a simple lack of nutrition. Just a lack of nutrition. Economic Times says that of the world's 828 million undernourished, over a quarter of those people live in India. In other words, you fix the hunger problem in India, you have fixed a quarter of the world's hunger problem. India is the largest Hindu country in the world. In 25 years, less than 25 years, it will be the largest Muslim country in the world. These are just a few of many things of why that missiologists, people who study missions, say that if you are serious about the Great Commission, you have to be serious about winning India for Christ. Not only that, but it is quickly becoming the largest, uh, one of the largest trafficked countries in the world. And on top of it, it is, I said it's a Hindu country, a Hindu country primarily. Um, let me explain a little bit about how, how that works, and some of you may already know this, but um, in that there's a caste system. And basically what it says is the gods, they have millions of gods, these gods have, you are born into a caste, whatever, whatever physical condition you have, whatever economic condition you're in, wherever you live, whatever it is, it's part of a caste that has put you there, and there's nothing you can do about that except hope for karma in the next life. And so what they are told many times is don't complain about your situation. Don't complain whether it's lack of food, whether it's abuse, whatever it may be. Just say nothing. Be quiet, and maybe the gods will smile on you, and you will receive uh, karma in the next life. And what we're telling people is, nope, there's a God in heaven who loves you. There's a God in heaven who cared so much about you that he stretched out his arms and he died and rose again on the third day for you. And I'm telling you, in the middle of it all, God is up to something in India. I'm telling you, the Lord is doing some great things. But I'll also tell you this. The northern part of India is a really difficult area. The church struggles The church struggles because there's a lot more persecution that is coming on. And there are certain things that I I, I can't say here today, but I will tell you this, that right now, uh, Compassion International is no longer being uh, renewed their visas in India. World Vision is no longer being renewed their uh, visas in India. 
And many of our missionaries have, have now began to lose their visas. And thank God we have a long-term relationship. And as of this point, they're allowing us to continue the work of what we're doing there. And it is not uncommon. I want to tell you it's not uncommon uh, as you see these different things for people to hear and to come to Christ and to be implemented into one of the churches that we have there. Let me just tell you what we're doing about it because I told you a few of the issues that are going on there, but let me tell you what we're doing. First of all, we are t feeding over 10,000 people a day. Feeding over 10,000 people a day, Monday through Friday, 10,000 people a day. And one of the things that we're doing with that is that um, you, we said that there's a, a lack of nutrition. It, we have gone out, we have tried to get a, a best grain rice and vitamins and so forth that we can to put into these meals because we realize that, that they, many people get one meal, that's it. They have one shot at this for the day and we're trying to do everything we can. And often what happens is people, feeding programs will go out and they'll just try to get something and, and fill the stomach but it doesn't take care of the nutritional value and hearts are right in that but we're trying to say, hey, we want to make sure that they're getting the best nutrition possible. As a matter of fact, you'll see that picture there. That's actually a, a feeding line there and I love that picture because it's, uh, these are all live shots. The second thing we're doing is we educate over 32,000 children daily. 96% of them are Hindu and Muslim. And um, by the way, these kids that go through school, many of them will start in kindergarten, go all the way up, and even into college, they're memorizing over 90 scriptures a year in part of their schooling. And uh, you can see that next picture, uh, little, this uh, little, little girl, little boy there, they have their uniforms. Uh, it's not uncommon to see these kids running around. They're sharing their uniforms with their brothers and sisters because they don't have any more. If you can go to that next picture there, this is one of our high school chapels. And uh, yeah, one of these high school chapels. And I mean, we share Jesus. They, they, they know what they're getting when they come into it, and we have the opportunity. This is just one of many uh, that we have going on there. The third thing that we do is we medically assist over 40,000 people a year in our hospital. And by the way, for the feeding, for the schooling, for the medical assistance, we don't, we don't charge anything. We're doing all this off the of generosity of churches like this. 40,000 people take care in our hospital. Matter of fact, you can see that it's actually a little boy about to get a cleft palate surgery there. Um, and uh, matter of fact, can you go to that next picture there? Um, you'll, see, uh, you'll see that's one side of the hospital. You can see it there. It may not look like anything to, to, uh, to us because we have beautiful, beautiful hospitals here in the United States and very blessed. But let me tell you, that is a beacon of hope for the people there. Go to that next shot there. You can show it, show it in the distance there. There it is in the distance. That's the other side of it. It's been painted since then, but that's the other side of it. And uh, you can see the, the area around. And everybody, matter of fact, they use the hospital as a landmark when they're giving directions. I don't know if you're familiar with Convoy of Hope. Anybody familiar with, Con with Convoy of Hope? Convoy of Hope, Hal Donaldson started Hal Convoy of Hope. He's got his, ver his vision and burden for it, according to his book, while he was sitting in the emergency room of our hospital right there. He said he was sitting there. He came to write uh, an article or a book or something on uh, Mark Buntain, who was the founder of our ministry. Mark Buntain um, had to go do something and left him, and he had just been rocked by watching all of the different ministries that are going. Well, I've only shared a few of the ministries we got going on there. And, um, and then Mother Teresa walks in, and she's now ministering there as well. And uh, he, he's sitting there, and she says to him in the ER, she says, uh, Honey, uh, what are you doing for the poor? And uh, he, he comically says, When Mother Teresa asks you a question, you tell her the truth. You don't lie to her. Right, And so he said to her, nothing. And she said, uh, well, listen, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. No one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And that's where we begun to see, we begun to see uh, people beginning to, to take up that mantle. And I want to tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at this. There are so many things that are happening right now that God is up to, things beyond this. And, uh, and I can share it if anybody has any questions you want to ask me later. I have no, no problem sharing it. But I just want to tell you, in your faithful giving, you guys have, have been supporters. And I appreciate Pastor Josiah. I appreciate uh, the staff. I appreciate this church for everything you've done. And I want you to know you're making a difference in India. 
The time to win India is now. According to those missiologists, they believe that the doors may be completely closed on us within 10 to 15 years until finally everyone is pushed out. One of two things, either getting pushed out that way or the return of Christ, <laughs> we have to win India for Christ. And I want to thank you for being a part of what God is doing there. It is truly a privilege, privilege to partner alongside of you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your care. And um, can I, can I uh, just pray over this congregation very quickly, Pastor Josiah? Is that okay? I just want to pray um, over this church because you guys have the heart for missions. And um, I just want to ask the Lord to continue to work in that. And so if we can just bow our heads, I, I want to pray over you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person that is sitting in this place today. I thank you for Faith Chapel in San Diego. I thank you for the, the love that the people here have for not just India, but for the world. And I pray, Father, that you would bless every person here in their generosity. God, as they are, are generous, we pray that, Lord, you would just continue to bless them in ways they cannot even imagine. And I pray that God, for this church, that you would send a harvest right here in San Diego. I pray, Father, that, that every person in here would begin to get a, a burden to win just one person in a year. Lord, that we can watch this thing double in a year. Lord, that you would begin to fill this place and that, Lord, you would begin to move in hearts and in lives because what we know is, is India needs Christ, but so does San Diego. And so, Father, we pray for blessing over the city. We pray for anointing. We pray for a move of God over the city. And, Father, we ask that Faith Chapel is right in the middle of that move of God. Holy Spirit, protect this place. Let your peace and your protection rest on this place, on the hearts, on the unity, on the facility, on every leader, we pray for anointing. We pray that you would give vision to Pastor Josiah. You would give vision to the leadership. And Father, we ask that you would continue to do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen, amen, amen. 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 Yes. Wow, good morning. Oof. Thank you, Mr. Brent Galbraith. What an incredible work is happening over there in Calcutta, India. That is amazing. I, I don't know about you, but my heart is so stirred for what the Lord is doing the world over. And uh, we, we just have to have a broader perspective. We have to have a broader perspective. There is something far more than going to church on Sunday, going to work on Monday, Go into the gym, in and out burger, back home, wake up, do it again, church on Wednesday. There's something so, so much greater than that. Our lives are not our own. So newsflash for all of us. When we said yes to Jesus, we signed our, ourselves on the dotted line and said, you know what, God? You can have it all. He's not interested in 10% of you, nor 50, nor 90. He wants all of it, all of your life. He's laid it down, his life, so that we can lay down our life. Jesus didn't go to the cross so we didn't have to. He went to the cross to show us how. So we can learn to lay our lives down. And so I'm honored to partner with other ministries and that are doing this very same thing all over the world, learning to lay their life down. And so you should be asking, thinking, and praying, God, what, what am I currently doing? What can I be doing differently? You know, this weekend, we're coming off the heels of the commission conference. Those of you that were here, were you blessed at the commission conference? I know there were several of us. I mean, 
Francis Chan preached on Friday night. It was amazing. Obviously, such an incredible, solid man of God. And then everything that happened on Saturday from the worship to the different breakouts, different missionaries that were doing work all over. The stage was filled with churches being planted and missionaries basically being sent out into the earth. And so it was just a marvelous thing to be a part of it. And so I want to thank you for those of you who came because I wanted you to experience this. I wanted you to get this deep into your heart. And uh, man, we're just riding on the heels of that. The Faith Chapel's always been a very missions-oriented church. Uh, we, I don't have the exact number. I think it's uh, around 68 uh, different missionaries that we currently support uh, that are literally going all over the world. And some are right here in our own backyard, and some are all over the, the globe. And so praise God for you. I want to just say thank you and honor you as being a missions-minded people. You live very generously, and uh, you, you really are making a massive splash in the great commission of sending forth laborers into the harvest field. And I'm so grateful for those of you who are able to financially do that. And I'm also grateful for those that are rising up in ministry, which we're going to talk about a little bit today as we get into the message. But there's definitely something prolific that we all should be doing. And we, we, we're, not, we're not permitted to just stand idly by. I don't see that in the gospel. I don't see that the gospel is like, hey, you know what, you, if you play the guitar, you're good. You don't really have to do anything. Just play the guitar. Hey, if you're just kind of, you got several kids, you probably got your hands full, so don't worry about it. It's for all of us. We have to be a missions-minded people. We have to be others-focused. Amen? And so we're going to talk about a, f- a few of those things today as we dive into the message. And uh, so if you have the app, you should definitely utilize that. It's got the notes on there. We're going to dive into the Red Letter series again that we're still, that we're still in. And uh, we've been going chronologically through the scriptures, kind of going through uh, the life of Jesus in particular and focusing on the major highlight moments in that. So that's where we're going to be camping through today. But once again... Brent Galbraith, thank you so much. Appreciate that. If you want to talk to him afterwards, I know he'll be around. You guys can definitely show some love. If God's tugging on your heart uh, to just connect with him at a deeper level, please do it. And I know that you will be tremendously blessed. Absolutely. Uh, One quick correction. The VBS meeting that was supposed to be happening after service today is not this week. It'll be next week. So just an FYI, if you were planning to attend that meeting, slight correction. It's not today. It is next week. Our mission is to culture like Christ. And the vision is Jesus. You know what? The more I have conversations with people, the more I'm proud of that. As I have conversations all this last weekend, this place was filled with all kinds of pastors and leaders from all over San Diego, and I hear this a lot. Pastor Josiah, what's your vision? Jesus. They're like, yeah, yeah, well, what else? It's Jesus. <laughs> Should it be more involved than that? And I know what they want me to say. I know they want me to say, hey, the plan is, is we're going we're gonna to plant 500 churches in the next this, that, and the other, and we're going to raise up this, and they want this big detailed thing. You know why? Because it looks, it looks and sounds really cool. And I give you that, no sweat. We have vision for some of those things. Oh yeah, that's all there. But you know what all that's really encompassed in? It's in Jesus. As we follow Jesus, as we aim at him, as we live like Christ, we will raise up more missionaries that will be sent forth into the earth. As we aim at Christ, more leaders will be raised up and we are going to influence and touch our city. I believe Faith Chapel is truly going to be a beacon of revival that the, the, the city, the influencers of the city will look to as for direction and need and guidance and that we will help resource people to fund and move in the things of God literally the world over. I have tons of vision and desire for all of those things. And as I narrow it all down, it all just comes back to focusing on him. Because if we aim at all of those things and miss him in the process, we lose. We can't afford that. I can't afford to be like, God, I'm too busy trying to build your kingdom. Stop talking to me. (laughs) Like, what is that? Jesus, I'm sorry, we're over here making disciples and doing X, Y, Z. And he's like, I really just want you to be with me. And as you learn to be with me, you'll gain my heart and actually be more effective in making disciples, planting churches, and going everywhere I called you to go because you didn't lose me in the process. Uh, You're my beloved, not my employee. We're going to dive in. I want to remind you. I want to remind you where we left off last week on the shattering barriers messages that we talked about last week. This last verse that I read was in Luke chapter 5, verse 10. Remember, it said that Jesus replied to Simon. He said, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. 
And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. We touched on this last week pretty hard about how they just left everything. They had the business. They had it all going on. It was, it was cracking. It was doing really good. He left everything and followed Jesus. And this so encapsulates the heart of the missions-minded church. It's where Simon Peter is getting launched into ministry, and it introduces a narrative that never changes. And me and Brent were talking about this just before service began. Essentially, he said this, almost took the note right out of my notes. He said, the more we gain his heart, the more our heart grows for people. The more we gain his heart, the more our heart grows for people. As we're aiming at him, we get everything else. So it's not a disservice to the vision to, not, to, to be focused on Jesus. It's actually the, the most purest vision you can have. That's why I love it so dearly. We have to have a heart for people. Why? Because people are on his heart. All kinds of people. Every ethnicity, every socioeconomic status on every nation in the earth. Everybody is on his heart. People across the world and people across the street. Everybody. Let's look at some incredible instances of what it looked like for Jesus to live on mission. Once again, this is sticking chronologically through our storyline that we've been in. So when we're coming in here with sermons on the Red Letter series, it's not like going, oh, okay, what should we preach on today? No, we're following the text. We're following the text on this is what's going on. So when you see something that's happening and what we're talking about, it's because it's next in the storyline. So Jesus alone is our perfect example. We're aiming at him to culture like him, absolutely, which is our mission, and we're gonna keep him our perfect vision. Keep that in mind as we track through where we're going now. We'll be in Mark 1, 21. We're gonna bounce around to a few places today, but we'll be in the storyline. Mark 1, 21. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue, and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. You see, apparently they had been accustomed to people who were teaching, but without authority. Knowing information, but having authority are two different things. You see, when I struggled with pornography, I had information about what it would like to be free. I had information about what God could do and how God was setting people free, and that was good. But when I actually got free from the problem, when those chains fell to the ground, a spiritual confidence and an authority came over to me that was unprecedented prior to the freedom that I had experienced. It's one thing to just know about it. It's another thing to have no shackles on your wrists. I'm grateful for people who have information about how to get off drugs or how to get off alcohol or that's great, but I can introduce you to some people in this very room. You might be sitting right next to them. Just look at them and you can just be like, that guy definitely, hopefully got set free. I'm just kidding, don't do that. I can introduce you to people in this room who struggled with addiction for many, many years and now they walk in freedom. And because they walk in freedom, there's an authority that I believe that they gain because of what they've accomplished, what they've done, what the Spirit of God has accomplished through them as they yield to Him. Amen? It's amazing. Now, I'm not saying that if you just get someone with authority to pray over you, so it's like some magic potion and then everything moves forward absolutely good. There's still a part on the receiver that they have to play for sure. But I'm believing that there's a heaviness, there's a chain, there's a a yoke that's lifted, and when, it's, when it was there before, now all of a sudden it's no longer there, that bondage is broken. It's Isaiah 10, 27, but it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. There is something special about people who walk in an authority over something and don't just talk about it. I want us to be a people that have had an experience with God. I want to fill this place with people who have had an experience with God. They know what he has done. They can tell you with the tears in their eyes what the Lord has done. It's one thing to read the scriptures and to speculate or to theorize about what God can do. It's another thing to say, let me tell you my story. I know the proof and the validity of what God can do in your life because I know what I was in. You can see the truth of it in my eyes. 
This place is going to be filled with those that have been healed in their body, and that's how they know the Lord is the healer. And they're going to be healed in their marriage, and that's why they'll have faith for your relationship. They're going to be healed in their mind, and that's why they're going to know that God can set the depressed free. They're going to be healed in their need for life, the desire to live, because the suicidal tendencies have been broken. And the chains are going to fall off, and we're going to fill this place with broken chains, and we're going to give God all the glory. I honestly believe this with all of my heart. I'm seeing it again and again and again and again in people's lives. Do you want to speak to David's brothers on how to slay the giants of the land? Or would you prefer to speak to David who's still holding the giant's head in his hands? That's a different way. There's a whole army out there about, here's what we should do. Goliath keeps coming out. We should do this. We should do this. We should do this. No one's willing to act. I'd rather go talk to the guy who's still holding his head who knows what he's doing. You see, some of you have gone through some stuff in here. You've got some history. You've got some scars. You've seen a thing or two. You've got some stories, but in the same token, you've also walked in a spirit of repentance and freedom, and you now hold the keys because of what you've gone through. Keys that unlock the chains of the people all around you. This is a big deal. I'm not afraid for people to pray for me that people have had scars, man. That's okay. The scar says a lot. It shows you've walked through some things, and yet you're still here, still standing. There's people in this room that have been in church for a long period of time, and yet you still love the Lord with everything in you, even after all that you've experienced. You've been hurt, had people stepped on your toes, people backstab you, bite you, maybe friendships that have been deteriorated. The list goes on and on. And at the end of it all, you still love the king. That says a lot. That's so much better than the fickle-minded person who's just like, at the sign of any little speed bump, we ditch and run away. We got to have some thicker skin. We got to have some intensity in who we are and how we live. We got to say, you know what? I am not the kind of person that is just going to sit idly by and let, let the enemy walk all over us. And I will not be the person to buck or to run at the first taste of adversity. Oftentimes, adversity is a great indicator of the, of the potential that you walk in. When, when the enemy is butting up against you, man, it's because there's some great things on the horizon. This church in particular has had lots of things butt up against it. It's been a lot of adversity. And if that's any prophetic indicator of where God's taking us, buckle your seatbelts, guys. If there's any adversity that the doors are closing in many ways all over India and it's going to be more and more challenging, what an exciting time to be alive. We had some conversation even yesterday with some people that were at the missions conference and they were connected with those who were doing work in Israel. And if you hadn't flipped on, on the news, you know, there was some attacks that took things to another level in Israel. And we should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem according to scripture. We should, be, we should be believing for peace. We should be believing for God's will to be done and his purposes to be accomplished in the earth. But it was, there was a missionary or a gentleman that was there who was doing work in, in, in Jerusalem and he said, you know what, it's scary. There's, there's, there's bombs flying overhead. There's sirens. They even sent a video in. And, but he said, what an exciting time to be alive because it opens up the adversity. The adversity opens up the hearts of the people. This is one of the problems that happens in America is because when the adversity is not as great as it should and we enjoy the freedoms that we have, we get so relaxed. It's so relaxed. That's one of the biggest challenges that I feel like I face is for us to have a sense of urgency in the church, recognizing the time is short. We got to be about our Father's business. We got to look at the life of Christ, even in the midst of the great freedoms that we enjoy. I'm grateful for those who had to walk through a lot and remain faithful to the Lord in spite of all they've had to walk through. It says so much. I believe that there's a teaching that comes out of those coupled with real authority, just like we're seeing here with Jesus. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees were only repeating what had already been spoken before, but Jesus shows up on the scene. He starts saying and doing new things with an authority unprecedented. He starts doing a new thing. Let's look at the next verse in our storyline. Verse 23. Suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit began shouting, 
Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus cut him short. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience. They began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority, even evil spirits obey his orders. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. Jesus wasn't just talking about new things. He was demonstrating the validity of what he was saying. Man, talk is cheap. Action speaks louder than words. Talk is cheap. Words are still good. I'm not saying don't use words. We use a lot of words around here. I'm using words right now. It's okay to speak. Just know that actions speak louder than words. Can you imagine Jesus is up there? He's talking about authority. He's talking about this. He's talking about the power of the kingdom of God. And then all of a sudden, the demon-possessed guy comes in there, and they're like, oh, Jesus. And the guy's like, ah, you know, set, set him free. And Jesus is like, oh, man, oh, my. Um, I don't know what to do. And he just kind of slips out the back door. It would totally invalidate everything he was saying. But because of what he was saying, he was able to back up with authority over the Spirit. There was even more of an attention that was drawn to the message. The message was crucial. The message was vital. The message was massive. He needed both working together. See, that's not what Jesus did, though. Jesus didn't just, you know, cover his mouth and run out the back door. He dealt with the problem. He speaks directly to the spirits. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. He wasn't suggesting. He spoke with the same authority that the people knew he had concerning his teaching, but now it's where the rubber meets the road, and he could back it up with his authority. There's a couple other things I want you to note from this account. What the spirits were saying was true. They declared Jesus is the Holy One of God. That's very true. Just because someone says something that's true, it doesn't mean that they have the right spirit. We need to operate in a spirit of discernment at all times. Amen? Jesus cut the spirit short, even though what it was saying was true. He wasn't going to allow them to speak on. You see, the spirit you have matters more than what's coming out of your mouth. The spirit you have matters more. I've just known some, let's just say, well-meaning people that had a wrong spirit. And they'll just come up to you and basically spiritually rub in your shoulders. Josiah, you're amazing. You're a man. God's got you in this. He's going to be all good. You know what? You really don't need these kind of people over here anyways. You just do what you need to do. And, and you just kind of ignore them. And don't worry about the leaders that God's put in your life like that. Those things don't really matter and stuff because you're the man. God's put you in that position of authority. So don't listen to them. Ah! That's some dicey information there. That's some dicey suggestions. Oh, don't worry. They're, the reason why they didn't want you to sing that solo is because they know that you're actually better than most of the singers that are up there anyways. They start just rubbing your shoulders, puffing you up. There's, there, there's stuff that's being said, whether true or untrue is irrelevant. The spirit behind it is negative. The spirit is divisive. Once again, we need to operate in discernment. Of course, you probably know the account that's in Acts chapter 16 where the woman was walking around and what she was saying to them, she said, these are the men that proclaim to you the ways of the living God. What they're saying is, is true. What she's saying is true. And Paul, greatly annoyed, eventually cast this demon out of her because she had the wrong spirit. But let's stick with the storyline. Let's look at what else Jesus was doing to keep furthering the mission. This happens right after Mark chapter 1, where we were just reading, okay? But I'm going to switch to Matthew's account. This is in Matthew 8, 14. When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. I love this. I don't know about you, but I have a great relationship with my mother-in-law. I want to know what your relationship with your mother-in-law is like. I realize that that's not the case with everybody. I wonder what Peter's relationship was like with his mother-in-law. I don't know. 
I can imagine finding out that she's got a fever, and Jesus says, oh, okay, I'll come and pray for her. And maybe Peter responds like, ah, (laughs) she's sick. And, uh, you know, Jesus, please don't heal her. (laughs) I just kind of want her to suffer like a little bit. Like, just not a lot, but like just a little bit, you know? Which didn't happen, of course, I'm joking. But this is a good instance to make this helpful statement concerning the scriptures. Just because something is in the scriptures, it doesn't mean that they're setting a precedent. Sometimes when you hear something in scripture, it's just them indicating this is what happened. They're just saying this is what happened. They're not saying anything crazy. They're not saying, hey, this is what you need to do henceforth moving forward. They're just saying this is what happened. Though, so let me give you a quick example. What we're not saying is that just because you're healed, you need to start cooking a meal for everybody. Though if I'm being honest, it's not a half bad idea. I'm just trying to be biblical. Let's just follow biblical context. Let's just do that. Nah, that's not exactly what's going on. You see, there, this was just telling the storyline. So sometimes you'll take people who say, just because you see something in Scripture that's being said, just because it's said in the Scripture, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the precedent that's being said moving forward. You, are you feeling me? Are you tracking with what we're saying? Okay, cool. Consistency. Jesus is saying the stuff and doing the stuff everywhere that he's going, but even with a simple command, the authority was there. Did you catch that? When the demons showed up, it was with a simple command. He just commanded to stop, and it was stop. It was dealt with with a simple command. You see, volume does not equal authority. Some people are just more demonstrative than others. Jesus often spoke very calmly, but with no less authority. That doesn't mean that when someone gets emotional or using some volume or is a demonstrative by nature individual that they're walking in a greater degree of authority. That's all I'm trying to say. Even in this instance, when Jesus speaks to the Spirit, he says, be quiet. He uses authority. He was very firm. I've learned that my dog responds that way. (laughs) Sonny, stop that. Come on, you're killing me. You just don't, don't do that. Don't do that. He doesn't listen. But when I say, Sonny, stop it, and I speak to him that way, I use an authoritative voice, he picks it up. Now, that's a little different because I'm speaking to my dog who doesn't understand, maybe understand what's going on. But when you're talking about prayer, when you're dealing with the spirit, it doesn't really matter the volume or the intensity that you're speaking. You can speak very calmly, you can speak very directly, and just use your authority, and the, the, the demonic will have no choice but to respond to that. Jesus often spoke very calmly, and there was no less authority. Let's look at the next verse here. This is verse 23 of Matthew 4. Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. He healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick. And whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and the east of the Jordan. This is amazing to me. This is remarkable. God was moving everywhere that he went. And where he was going and what he was doing, he wasn't just saying the stuff. He was saying the stuff and demonstrating the stuff with authority everywhere that he went. And look at how God was moving. People were bringing the sick to him, and he touched and healed them all. Not the ones that weren't, not the people who were like, oh, man, man, this, yeah, you got cancer? I, mean, that, I don't know about that. That's a tough one. Hey, give me somebody with a headache. Give me somebody whose left toe hurts, you know? It wasn't like that. He just was like, I know what I carry, and he dealt with everything 24-7. It was not a problem. Large crowds followed him wherever he went, and he took care of it. Once again, let's look at verse 23 once again. He was teaching the good news about the kingdom, and he demonstrated the kingdom by healing every kind of disease and illness. This should be part of our healthy diet as believers. Preach the gospel, pray for the sick. Preach the gospel, pray for the sick. This is a healthy diet for any church. We should be a people comfortable with praying for others that need to be prayed for. Everything he did is an example to us. Everything he did. 
We don't get to pick and choose things from the life of Christ. We get to look at the life of Christ and say, that there is our example. How did Jesus, we're talking a little bit about missions work today. When Jesus went around and did missions work, what was he doing? He was walking around, preaching the gospel, ministering to the hurting. So thank God for ministries that are doing exactly that. Going around, ministering to the hurting, ministering to the people who need it, praying and and praying for them and watching miracles happen. But not just, not just de- deteriorating that by saying, you know what, we're not going to pray for those people. No, we can't deteriorate the mission. Look at the life of Christ and follow suit. You never know how the story will end. Our job is to be obedient to the next thing that we feel him leading us to do. This is how we live missionally. Amen? It's in the life of Jesus. Let me tell you a story. So I've told you many times about my Theo. He's my uncle. He's my dad's brother. And in his book, there's this really, really great story. And I'm going to have him come minister sometime in the near future so you'll be able to hear it and get, get an opportunity to pick up the book. It's really great. But he tells the story from hearing from God to go pray for this guy. This guy had been in a motorcycle accident. So this guy gets hurt. He's in this motorcycle accident. And so him and Maitia, his wife, they go and they go to the hospital to go pray for this guy. He's in the hospital for two days. They can't get in. They wouldn't let him in. And so while lingering around the hospital, outside is this man who had fallen on his motorcycle. His wife was out there. So my Theo and my Thea start engaging in conversation with him. And as they start engaging with conversation with him, they end up leading this guy to the Lord. I'm sorry, they lead his wife to the Lord outside in the hall. So she gets led to Jesus, gives her heart to Jesus, which is amazing. The first person that he ever led to the Lord was this lady. So he was a freshly saved believer. My dad, my dad was the one who actually led him to Jesus. Okay, so he leads him, and this guy gets, my, uh, my uncle gets saved, he starts following God, and now he's trying to practice leading his faith, right? So he leads this lady to the Lord outside in the hallway, and as that happens, now they've got an inside scoop. So now it's like they're kind of in, they're sort of connected. So guess what? The door opens up, and he's able to go in and to minister to this other guy. So he goes in and starts ministering to this guy. He's freshly saved. He goes to pray with this man. His name's John. The man was so hurt that he could barely even squeeze his hand to respond to any of the questions that they were asking him due to the extent of his injuries. Still, while he was there, my Theo, my Thea, lead this man to Jesus on his deathbed. And the very next day, this man dies, passes away, had no relationship with God, goes on mission, fights against the adversity, didn't just show up and go, ah, well, I guess we can't get in. I guess we're out of here, you know, and then just turn around and walk out. They stayed consistent. They look for God to open the doors. They go in. They lead this guy to Jesus. He gets saved, dies literally the next day because of their obedience to go and be faithful to God and live on mission. This is beautiful. Now, if that's not good enough, my Theo later sees a picture of this man when he was younger, when he didn't have all the injuries, Turns out, this guy was actually an old buddy of his from when he served in the military, and he had no idea. He actually, this, this is this from the book, it was an old drinking buddy of his from back in the Philippines while he was in the military before he had met Jesus. He had no idea at the time, but he had just led his dear friend to Jesus, and he didn't even realize it, and he didn't recognize his name because he only knew him by a nickname. Isn't that amazing? God had brought it full circle, and the only people that were, the first people he was leading to Jesus out of obedience to God was a friend of his from back in the day when they served in the military. God knew what he was up to. The goal is just for you and I to live on mission 24-7 everywhere that we go. We have to be bold, courageous people that don't sit as apathetic Christians sitting idly by waiting for something miraculous to land in our lap. It's time to initiate. It's what Jimmy Darts was talking about in his session yesterday where he said, this is green light Christianity, not red light. You don't have to wait for Jesus to come back a second time and to say, oh, by the way, go. Like, we, we already were sent. Go therefore. He already given us his authority. He has already put his spirit within us. We've got every reason to be going. We don't have to sit back and wait for another initiation. It's time to go. It's time to do something. Get your hands dirty. Let's go. Let's go back to Mark chapter one. This is now verse 35. It says, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. 
When they found him, they said, everyone's looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. This is why I came. So we traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Jesus had a consistent diet of praying, being with the Father by himself without a bunch of other distractions. That place of private devotion is key. You see, if you only know how to pray publicly on a microphone in front of other people, you're missing the whole point of prayer to begin with. Private devotion sets the table for public influence. How you live privately will set the table for what God will do for you publicly. If you feel called to a public ministry and there's things that are brewing in your heart about where God wants to take you, you don't need to wait for all those doors to open and platforms to be established and for you to get a shiny little name tag. Start seeking God today. And as you start seeking God today, he will meet you in that spot and do something marvelous. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. In fact, for this next part, turn your eyes to the screen. Not to spoil this beautiful day or anything, huh? <laughs> Come on. It's a leopard. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. It's okay. Rabbi, 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 Rabbi it's disease. You can. Please. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. I know you can heal me if you are willing. I am willing. <laughs> Be cleansed. Thank you. I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. What can I, what can I ever do? No. Do not say anything to anyone. You don't seek your own honor. Please just do me this one thing. But what do I tell people? Go, show yourself to the priest. Let them inspect you and see that you are cleansed. Make the proper offering in the temple as Moses commanded. And go on your way. Who has an extra tunic? Just one of you, just one of you. That's enough. Green is definitely your color. Oh. <laughs> Not too shabby. <laughs> Come on. Isn't that powerful?
One of the villages, Jesus met a man with advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean. And Jesus reached out and touched him and said, I am willing, be healed. And instantly the, instantly the leprosy disappeared. Notice the man's approach. He came with an approach of humility and honor. Furthermore, Jesus is breaking cultural barriers once again. The leprous people were not to be touched. If they were, then that person who touched them would be ceremonially unclean according to the law. And so they had to go through a ritual in order to get back cleansed again. Jesus touched him, breaking through some of those emotional tears that this man has been walking through. This is, there's a, there was such an emotional toll that went on the leprous people because they were ostracized from society. It's not just the physical problems, but it was the social and emotional ones that was oftentimes even worse than the physical pain they were dealing with. They became outcast to society because of the condition that they had. Imagine, you're the person that's always the nuance. You're the person that's always like, don't touch me, don't come up against me, don't be near me, unclean, unclean. And they'd spit on the ground near them in order to, to shame them. Oftentimes believing that their sickness was due to their own sins. It's likely that nobody had touched this man for a very long time. Jesus embraces him. Every one of us is called to live on mission. Every one of us is called to look at the lifestyle that Jesus lived and follow suit. Every one of us. For some of us, he's going to send us to Calcutta, India on special work. Others of us to Mexico and some to Asia or Africa. Some of us aren't called to go to any of those specific locations. But we can partner with others who are called to go through prayer and through finances. And some of you are called to influence the gym that you attend for the glory of God. Some of you have your favorite restaurant, and there's waiters and waitresses that are there that need the gospel as much as anybody else does in the slums of Africa. And you're there on mission. I believe Faith Chapel currently supports these great missionaries all over because we take this seriously. So make no mistake about it, we're touching the globe with this important message. We cannot, we simply cannot do this without you. Together, we're needed to, and this is your paramount points. Together we need to be doing this. We need to be praying. That's number one, of course. You saw it in the life of Jesus. You saw it in the text that we were talking about. Jesus often withdrew himself, went and spent time with the Father. He was praying and seeking God, getting direction from the Lord. That's how we function around here too as leaders, just so you know. We don't just go and flippantly do everything. We can't do everything. We have to be choosy. We have to only partner with people that we feel God has called us to partner with. There's an intentionality that's there. And in the place of prayer is where we receive direction from the Lord on what we should be doing. So slipping away to be with the Father to pray is massive. You can definitely be praying. You should be praying. And if you don't know what else to pray for, like I talked about earlier, at least that right now, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, according to Scripture. And let's believe for God to just bring touch, a touch of grace and healing over there that, that uh, innocent people on every side would be protected and that God's mercy would be over there. So be praying. The second thing you could be doing is you could be giving. Your willingness to support those who are spreading the good news both here and abroad makes a difference in the world. You're partnering with these amazing efforts, both practically, financially, spiritually. Don't think that, that giving financially is not a spiritual thing. It absolutely is. Giving spiritually is very, is very I'm sorry, giving financially is very much a spiritual act. It is an act of worship to the Lord. I believe that. You see all throughout scripture, we talk about it oftentimes when we take up offerings, we talk about how our gift of finan our financial gift is an act of worship before the Lord. It's sacrifice, it's bringing something to God and saying, God, I'm giving this to you. So even though you can support great missions works like Calcutta Mercy and so many others that are doing wonderful things the world over, those gifts, yes, they go to the organization, but it's really a gift unto the Lord. When you can have that mindset, you can begin to understand, God, my intention on this whole thing is to, is to please you. This is a gift of worship to the King. And I, once again, thank you for being such a missions-giving church. You know, I want to tell you this. 
One thing that, that I've done ever since I got turned on to missions way back in the day when I was like a teenager and had no money. You remember when it was like a teenager and you had like, you just zero. People are like, hey, we're going to Jack in the Box. And you're like, I can't go because <laughs> I can't buy anything. I remember at that time when I was first starting to get a job, being challenged to give to missions. And that was something that was on my heart. I was like, I want to do this. And I've made it a point every single year since that date to increase my missions giving. It may not be a lot. Sometimes I didn't increase a whole lot, but I've always been increasing because I want to live missionally minded on a yearly basis where I'm constantly saying above my tithes, above my offerings, above all the other things, I'm also going to give to missions specifically. And I want to do that and keep challenging myself to make a difference. Otherwise, what am I going to do? Buy another pair of shoes? What am I gonna do, buy a nicer car? Like these things are great. Is there anything wrong with nice cars and nice shoes? No, I look fresh. But the whole point is not to just have more materialistic things. You can invest into souls and you can take souls with you into eternity, amen? The gospel of Jesus Christ can be advancing. Praise God for that. And as we honor the Lord in all things, we can live a frugal life and be missionally minded, yes, through our prayers, yes, through how we live, but also 100% through our giving. So if you're not doing that yet, I want to encourage you to do that. Live a generous life. That's why we put it on the signs out there. It says live generously everywhere that you go. Your willingness to support those who are spreading the good news both here and abroad makes all the difference in the world. The Apostle John is speaking of those who are laboring for the Lord when he says this in 3 John 7. It says, for they are traveling for the Lord and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that we, so that we can be their partners as they teach the truth. He's just saying those that are laboring from the Lord they are not able to do what they're able to do at the capacity they're able to do it unless we can help send them. So this is our opportunity to say, how can I partner with? How can I, how can I help? If you're not giving currently to missions work here at Faith Chapel, I wanna encourage you to do it. Click on the Give tab, go to the website, set it up and select missions. And it will support men and, and like, like Brent Galbraith and that are doing work with Calcutta Mercy all over the world and the many, many other dozens of other missions work and projects that we are seeing happen. We just added several new missionaries, even just this last month. Some that are doing stuff right here and some that are arrows being shot from our quiver literally across the globe. We can only do that. You can only do that as we support them financially and through prayer. It's amazing. This needs to, there needs to, to be a unction in our spirit to meet these needs and to support them as what God's called them to do. Let me give you the third and final thing. And this is, in my personal opinion, I think this is the most important. We need to be obedient. So we need to be praying, we need to be giving, we need to be obedient. The reason why is that if you're praying and, and, and if we're giving, but nobody's willing to be obedient, we're at a standstill. We have to be obedient to what God is calling us to do. More than anything else, you have to be obedient to the voice of the Lord. When he says go, the answer has to be yes. How many people in this room are here because somebody else said yes to the go of the gospel? I am. I can introduce you to several other people all across this room that you're only here because a, a church was planted and a pastor pastored that church. You're only here because somebody sat down with you and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. You're only here because you had parents that somebody else reached that then raised you up in the church and in the faith, believing Jesus is the savior of the, of the world, the living God. Those things are only your present reality because somebody else went with the gospel. It's true for all of us. How many people in this room have that testimony? Faithful ones who carry faith in the goodness of God. Would you please stand? I have a very, I feel like, specific kind of altar call that I want to do in relation to this. I want to pray for people. If you were at the commission conference, then you probably got a facet of this anyways but I felt like it was indicative of us to, to do this this morning as well. Specific to those who feel the call of God to ministry. Maybe it's local, maybe it's around the world. 
but you feel like the Lord is drawing you to ministry of some sort. If that's you, if you feel like you have a specific call to ministry, I want you to feel free to come on up to the front. You can come on up. If you have a specific call to ministry, maybe you're already in ministry or maybe you're working in ministry, don't be distracted. This is between you and Jesus, not anything else. You have a specific call to ministry. This may be something as simple as God's putting it on your heart to start a small group. Cool. This may be something as simple as God's been launching you into different things that have been on your heart that you've never had the the tenacity to pull the trigger on and now it's time for you to move forward. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Close your eyes if you have to. You have a specific call to ministry. Once again, we're all called to do the things that Jesus has called us to do. The life of Jesus to be replicated and for every single one of us to do the ministry of Christ. Absolutely, it's for everybody. But I realize that there's specific callings on people's lives for ministry. That's who I'm specifically speaking to right now. Are you called to start a small group? Are you called to plant a church? Are you called to go to the nations? We wanna help you accomplish those missions. We wanna link arms with you. And we just wanna pray for you today that the Lord would just establish you in everything that's needed to get to the next level. Would you close your eyes? Mighty God, we're looking at you. We're looking at you, Jesus. Father, I'm asking for mercy for every single person that feels a call to ministry on their life. Many of these people up here I know, I know what their calls are, and several of them I don't know yet, but I'm excited to find out what you wanna do through them. They're just getting started. I thank you, God, for for musicians. I thank you for small groups. I thank you for preachers. I thank you for creative businessmen. I thank you for church planters rising up out of here. I thank you, Lord God, for I believe the word that was prophesied over Faith Chapel that you're gonna do great things in this place and there's gonna be sister churches that will also rise up all around the nations that are gonna be Faith Chapels, that God's gonna do great things. Lord, do, do that, God, that's awesome. And even others that just feel led to go start their own thing that's not even connected to us, we would resource them and bless them and pray for them and encourage encourage them to go do whatever you've called them to do, God. We want to champion them for that. Hallelujah. I'm asking God for just blessing to fall on all of these people, tenacious ones, with the call of God on their life. Bless them, God. In the name of Jesus, bless them. Bless them. Thank you, God. Let it marinate for just a moment. I'm gonna believe for the Holy Spirit just to just download stuff into your mind, into your heart, what he's calling you to do. Speak to them, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Send out missionaries, God, in here. People who need to run after you with everything in them. I'm asking for mercy, God. I'm asking for mercy, God. Pour your spirit over them. Lord, I can't imagine. We just heard so many testimonies this last weekend of so many people that came to faith, people that came to know you simply because others said yes to the gospel. Today is the day, Lord God. Send them. Wake them up. To do ministry how Jesus did. To preach and to demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there's anybody in here that's not right with God, it begins with this. I pray that you would just get to a point of realization, even in this moment, you say, man, I need Jesus with everything in me. My heart's far from God. I'm not close to him. I know I have issues in my life that I need to lay down before him. I can't get freedom unless I surrender. And so I'm praying that that would be your reality today, that you would come before the Lord in this very precious moment and you would yield your heart to him. He's knocking on the door of your heart because he loves you so much. Today could be your very moment where you would yield to God in a fresh new way. 
I have lots of new friends that I'm meeting, many of which are just freshly saved. I'm going to tell you some of their stories in the, in the weeks to come. There's so many great things happening. There's people all around you yielding and bending the knee to Jesus. This could be your moment. I'm going to say a prayer and just pray over you that you would just walk that out. And then we're just going to minister to people. I want to do what we felt Jesus was doing in the scriptures. All throughout, everywhere Jesus was going, what was he doing? He was preaching the gospel and demonstrating the gospel. So we're going to fill this altar. We're going to work the altar. We're going to have my altar ministry team. They're going to come up. We want to pray for you. If you're freshly saved, awesome. We're going to pray for you. We're going to get you established. We're going to see you walking this out. We want to see you get baptized and get in the foundations class, which is going to be an amazing class. My dad's been teaching it. He's now passing the baton to Joel. Joel's going to be teaching it next for about nine weeks. It's going to be so good. I want to see you growing in your faith. But you also might be people who are still up here saying, I'm called to ministry. Great. We want to lay hands on you. We want to pray for you. We want to see God send you out. We want to partner with you. We want to know what you're doing. So our altar ministry team is going to come as well. And I'm just going to play a break of prayer and dismiss everyone. Father, I'm asking right now this morning, I know there's a lot going on. There's a lot of distractions. There's all that. But we're not going to let the enemy rob this moment in any way, shape, or form. If you are needing to be, do business with God and give your heart to Jesus, now is your moment. Would you pray a prayer something like this? Mighty God, I welcome you into my life. I need to know you as Savior and Lord. Come and change me from the inside out. Transform me. I make a bold proclamation of my faith in you, Jesus the Christ. I love you because I recognize you first love me. Come into my life. Change me forevermore. I receive it now in the mighty name of Jesus. If you prayed that prayer at some point, man, I'm congratulations. At some point, come up here. They're going to put a slide on the screen that will have like a QR code you can scan. You can click on the app. There's a lots of things to do. If you're already up here, just stay up here for a couple minutes. We want to go down and we want to lay hands on you and pray for you. Those that feel called to ministry. If you need healing in your body or something, fantastic. We want to pray with you. We want to believe for God to touch you. Just like we've been reading throughout all these scriptures. Jesus was casting out demons. He was healing the sick. We want to pray with you as well, okay? So if you need any of that, come up to the front. We're going to be at the altars and we're going to be praying for you, all right? Let's do this. Jesus.